Welcome to the Beamsville Church of Christ online ministry. Services are presented on YouTube, Facebook, and our website one week following recording. Scriptures marked NLT are taken from the Holy Bible, New Living Translation. Copyright by Tyndale House Foundation. Used by permission, all rights reserved. Scripture quotations marked NIV are taken from the Holy Bible, New International Version, NIV. Copyright 1973, 1978, 1984, 2011 by Biblica Inc. Used by permission of Zondervan. All rights reserved worldwide. Zondervan.com. The NIV and New International Version are trademarks registered in the United States Patent and Trademark Office by Biblica Inc. The message for this week's video is titled Limitations in Christ. Thank you to Dave, Kristen, and Paul for being part of it. Paul will read the main scripture as part of the sermon, but to begin this video, I'll be reading Philippians 3, 10 to 14 from the New Living Translation. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I want you to know I will confess that it's taken approximately three or four months of realizing how I could take this off without extracting my hearing aids or my glasses, but I figured it out. Not a swift boy, but <laughs> persistent. Welcome, we're glad you're here to worship with us. I'd like to read a couple of short readings that in this time of stress, confusion, uh, there are a number of adjectives that could be added to the list. The unknown. But we have assurances from Scripture in a number of different Scriptures. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 4. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praises will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And in 1 Peter 2, starting at verse 9, but you are a chosen priesthood, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I have a quote from a guy named Paul Bain. And Jesus is always seeking to express his love to others through you. There are a few announcements. Oh, the big step for Daniel's wife and daughter planning to come to Canada. They're process and medical assessment this past week. So we pray for them. They're 
acceptance and arrival for Diane, Jenny's family, Debbie's mom, Lori, Kathleen, Joyce and Ralph, for strength and peace for their caregivers and for their continued recovery. Ralph been hospitalized with a brain hemorrhage, a return of cancer after six years, and pray for her recovery. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, sometimes we're at a loss for words for how to be a comfort to those who are in duress, in distress, in discomfort, be it physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Our words are inadequate. So we ask for your prayer, for your help in our prayer, that we may be a comfort, that you will help us to express ourselves. We're thankful for your power, your grace, and your mercy. We ask that you be with those who we have mentioned in our prayer request this morning. May you give them, afford them what they need to draw closer to you. Help us, Father, as we continue our worship this morning, that we may draw close to you, that we may receive strength also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, I don't know who, who found that uh, video. Was that you, Adam? Good job. It was very good and very apt. It's as if we had communicated previously about what we were going to talk about. So uh, it, it worked really well. Uh, our scripture this morning is um, Romans 7, uh, 14 through 8, 4. Uh, but I want to start off with a story. It's... Uh, you know, uh, uh, a long, long time ago in a land far, far away, uh, specifically this weekend and from here to the Pinery and back. Um, we have a bit of a family tradition. We go to the Pinery Provincial uh, Park. Does anyone know where that is? <clears throat> Near Grand Bend, just south of Grand Bend. Uh, they do a little Halloween thing every year uh, in one of the campgrounds. And so we go and my sister's family go and my parents and my sister-in-law's family and all socially distanced. It's good because it's camping. You can kind of just chuck the candies at the kids as they walk by, you know, it works, works out well. Um, <clears throat> so we were there. Um, uh, turns out there was a local power outage last night from 12.30 till about 5.30, this is what, what I'm told. Uh, turns out our trailer <clears throat> doesn't, the furnace doesn't work when the power isn't working. It works fine when the power is working. It's propane. So be, anyway, so we had to pack up at 2.30 last night and drive back. So this morning I am asking for your mercy and grace uh, because uh, uh, I am not at my tip-top shape. In fact, I am dealing with limitations this morning. And that's our topic uh, this morning. Uh, limitations, weakness, failures, <clears throat> you think about it, the Bible is a really odd holy book compared to other holy books. It's full of people who, on the one hand, are the messengers, servants, friends of God, critical to his work in this planet, and yet they're also the same people that the Bible freely says are full of limitations, weakness, and failures and not minor things. Uh, a really short list 
uh, Abraham. Everyone, you know who Abraham is? Uh, the father of the Israelite nation. Kind of, kind of big. Uh, it's a, it's a, to, to call your son a son of Abraham in Jesus' time was a big deal. Uh, and to say you weren't a son of Abraham, as Jesus implies at one point, is like the biggest insult you can possibly throw at somebody. Yeah, he doesn't trust God enough at one particular point and sends his wife in as his sister instead, just to avoid conflict, basically. Uh, Moses, the one who brings the law to Israel, the, 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 the human lawgiver. God is the lawgiver, but he's the one who ushers that law in through to the people. Uh, there's a bunch of things we could list here. Moses is a very interesting individual. Uh, there was this, uh, uh, back at West, we, we had this... Uh, uh, children's night that we used to do. We used to find videos and play them. And there was one that made Jesus out to be, or um, Moses out to be this like superhero person. And I, every time we would watch it, we had to kind of debrief the kids. We're like, okay, yeah, Moses wasn't quite the superhero this seems to suggest he was. So one little incident that I had kind of forgot about, uh, in between the burning of the bush and Moses going to, to Egypt, to make his declarations. Does anyone remember this? It's a, it's a little tiny little two verse bit. Um, it, it says that God was so upset with Moses that he was about to kill him on the spot. And only the inter intervention by someone he happened to be with uh, saved his life. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, David, what's the phrase we know David by? The man after God's own heart. Uh, he commits adultery, and then in order to cover up that adultery, he commits murder. Uh, but okay, that's Old Testament. Yeah, things were rougher back then, rough around the edges. The New Testament, it's all, all's good in the New Testament. Okay, Jesus' chosen 12 disciples, those who received, uh, who learned and received from Jesus directly throughout his entire ministry. Do you remember James and John? Did you, what was their nickname? Do you remember this? Sons of Thunder? Yeah, not without uh, meaning. Uh, they go into a random uh, Samaritan town. The Samaritans are rude to Jesus. Uh, what do they say? Burn it to the ground. <laughs> they say we should call fire and destroy this town. Another time, uh, <clears throat> they approach Jesus, or rather, I should say, they, they use this ploy. Those of you who... Um, uh, who, who, who remember being younger, this, this may be a familiar ploy, they, they go through their mother and say, hey, Jesus, can you, uh, can you get us ahead of the line of all the other disciples in your new kingdom? Uh, we'd like to be the more powerful people. Now, that displays a lack of knowledge of what this new kingdom is going to be, but it's not the best. Peter, Peter uh, denied knowing Jesus three times. Even after the resurrection, okay, so before the resurrection, <clears throat> right? Uh, we're we're going to give everybody a pass. After the resurrection, G, uh, Peter has to be uh, schooled by the Apostle Paul when he starts uh, refusing to associate with Gentiles and taking up the position that Gentiles had to become like Jews in order to be good Christians. There are different types of limitations, uh, the ones we talked about here were, were sin, <clears throat> serious. Um, but that, not all limitations are <clears throat> serious. Some are amoral. They're, they're, they're not, uh, they're, they're not, they don't pertain to our uh, spiritual being per se. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, some limitations are positive. Uh, I know that may sound wrong, uh, but John 15, uh, Jesus talks about the fruit and the vine and the branches. And he talks about uh, how sometimes you're productive, but then also sometimes God prunes you. The gardener, God, prunes you, cuts you back. Uh, that's a limitation. Uh, and that, in that case, it is God who is putting a limitation on us. Now, it says in that scripture, so that we will be more fruitful in the future. It's not without cause, but nonetheless. Uh, we all have limitations in our lives of various ways, shapes, and forms. Uh, I told you about one that I have right at the beginning. I also, some of you may or may not know, I have a couple slip discs in my back. Uh, so a big limitation for me is physical pain. 
uh, since 2000 or so. Um, the, just the, the idea of being able to stand for a long time or walk for a long time or when other people, I, I, I grew up, we were, we were nature people. We loved going camping and going on hikes and uh, we would go up and down the Niagara Gorge constantly and up and down the trails on the escarpment constantly. Well now when I do those things I have to think, are there benches along the way? How far? You know, um, those sorts of things are important and might result in me saying, yeah, maybe not today. Uh, there are other types of limitations. There are other types of things that hold us back. Sometimes uh, they're the way we think about ourselves or family limitations or financial limitations. Uh, there's lots of different kinds. The question our smor this morning is how do we think our, of ourselves, of our church, of our faith, of our mission? Uh, let's go to Romans 7, if you have your Bibles with me or on the screen. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read Romans 7, 14 20, uh, through 24. Here the Apostle Paul talks about his limitations. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I, do, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me who does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I'm not afraid to ask the audience questions, so this is a period where you can answer. Um, how does Paul describe himself here in this text? Wretched man. Sorry? A wretched man. A wretched man, yeah. What, what does he want to do? Good. Good. But what does he actually do? Evil. Evil. Um, he describes that he wants to do good, to be good, and yet sin and evil are always there present. And in fact, according to this text, it seems like a lot of the time anyway, we don't get percentages or anything, the evil and the sin seem to win out. <laughs> he seems to be constantly battling against doing the things he doesn't want to do and trying to do the things he does but isn't able to. And yeah, he ends the section with, with 24, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. So I have a question. This is, okay, this is the Apostle Paul. Is it, you know, does anyone remember from Sunday school who the Apostle Paul was? Rough beginning, yeah give you that. But this is at a point in his life where he has been on multiple missionary journeys. He has planted how many churches? He has, done, he has been a part of how many great works? This is the great Apostle Paul, uh, author of most of the New Testament, if you go by um, numbers of books, not necessarily word count. And yet, this is how he describes himself. And not how he describes himself but then I converted to Christ, and this is no longer me. This is how he describes himself as he is doing those great things. You, you may know, uh, I think I've mentioned it before, my affinity lies with the Star Trek universe. Uh, but occasionally there is something useful in the other star-related universes, occasionally. But in this case, I, I, I get to uh, dunk on the other star-related universes, so win-win so for me. Uh, you may remember in one of the original Star Wars movies, 
that Yoda says to Luke, I believe it's on the swamp planet that I don't know the name of because it's not in Star Trek, so why would I know that? Uh, but he says uh, to Luke, uh, do or do not, there is no try. You remember that, that line from one of the movies? Uh, write this down, this is important. Yoda is wrong. In Christianity, it is about the trying. Successfully doing, while good, is not required. The point is mercy and grace of Christ and that we try. His mercy and grace will cover the doing part. Uh, in John, uh, 1 John uh, 3.20, John tells us that even when our hearts condemn us, even when we fall short, God is greater than our hearts. Now, he also says in the following verses that it is better if our hearts are in sync with God. That is much better. But it's not required. God is greater than even if our own hearts condemn us. There's a sense in which we tend to think of ourselves as primary, primarily defined by our limitations, our failures, our inabilities to succeed, uh, and that that problem, and that's the problem with the question, shouldn't the Apostle Paul be better? Many of us say the same thing about ourselves. Now, shouldn't Paul be better? But that question is using Yoda's way of framing life, focusing on the negative, the fact that we haven't succeeded, that we have limitations. What the Apostle Paul does in Romans uh, 7, 25 through 8 through 4, the response to his lived condition is to say, yes, I have limitations. But in this case, the limitation, in his case for Paul, it's the limitation of sin in his life. But Jesus is so much better, and he has overcome all of his limitations. Let's read on in um, Romans 7. We'll start again at verse uh, 24. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the sin, to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did through sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin to the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not have to live according to flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul describes himself as a body of death in the previous section. He asks the question, who will rescue me from this tragic condition? Where, is, where does that rescue come from in the text? From God. From God. God through Jesus. Yeah. There is no condemnation. Well, where's this condemnation coming from that Paul is talking about? From the sin in his life? From the failure that he has? And why is there no condemnation? Because of what Jesus has done. Uh, because through Jesus, the law of the Spirit that gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And then he goes on. Uh, I, I, I mention it frequently in my sermons. I, I'm amazed at how many points the gospel is repeated in, in the text. Uh, again, we have a re repeat statement of the gospel here uh, in verses uh, 3 and 4. Um, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so condemned sin in the flesh, in order that your righteous, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Paul is saying he he receives so much mercy and grace from Jesus that that condition he had before, the wretched state he existed in, no longer applies. He is freed from that limitation. But notice that that doesn't. It solves it in a certain way. He is free from it, but it doesn't make it magically disappear. Uh, it, it, Paul doesn't conclude the same, and therefore, I no longer have this struggle. I'm done. 
And I think that's true in our lives as well. Uh, our limitations, they may be covered and they may be, uh, they may be uh, covered, overwhelmed by Jesus, uh, but we still feel the effects of them in our lives. Uh, but the difference is we do not have to be defined by them or be, we can choose to move beyond them. Uh, notice uh, at the end of that section, the, the Apostle Paul, he, he still pushes, you know, his, his condition is that he, uh, he, is, he still struggles with living a holy, pure life. Well, he still pushes towards living a better life. The last uh, sentence is, those who do not live according to flesh, but live, but according to the spirit. So there is a push forward. There is a, we still want to try. We're still going somewhere, uh, but it's not defined by that. Whatever limitations we face, th there may be personal limitations in our lives. Uh, right now, there's a lot of people hurting because of the pandemic, uh, economic, uh, uh, isolation, mental, uh, family. Um, there's a lot of ways in which people are hurting. Uh, we can choose to look at our lives through the lens of we can't. Or it could be our personal faith lives. You know, I haven't been able to beat this struggle. I've been struggling for this for years and years and years, and I, I've honestly tried, and I just haven't got it. There was a congregation uh, that I worshipped with uh, down south, um, and I thought this was a perfect, I, this was a perfect example of a, of, a, of a redemptive community. So I was there for about two and a half years. There was a gentleman who, for the entire time I got there, he owned a gas station outside of town, he would come up eh, once, one or two months, come out to the front. In the southern U.S., it's common to have an altar call, and you'd have people come forward and do the things. And um, he, he would come forward, and he was always struggling to quit smoking. He'd come up, and he'd ask, I, I believe sincerely, the congregation's help. You know, I'm trying again. I'd love your support and your prayers. Um, and the entire two and a half years I was there, he never successfully quit smoking, at least permanently. And yet every time he would come forward, the church would embrace him physically and metaphorically, give their encouragement and support. And I did not get a whiff of exasperation or tiredness or get on with it. It was truly a, we're behind you every time. So there's things like that in our lives where we have something we're struggling with. Maybe it's in our faith or it's in our community of faith. Every community of faith is different and interesting and weird, I would argue. And we have things about us that are sometimes difficult to work with, difficult to move around. And there are limitations associated with that, especially right now in pandemic when we have to be so far apart and not in each other's homes and you can't speak to any other without kind of interpreting through the mask. Uh, there are limitations with that. But what I want to say this morning is Jesus is more than our limitations. Do we live our lives, do we view our lives through our limitations, our lack of, or through Jesus' grace and mercy? I have two, two applications for us this morning. If you're new to Jesus' mercy and grace, or forgotten those things, I invite you to uh, invite, or I invite you to welcome those uh, those the mercy and grace into your lives to overcome the limitations uh, of whatever you might be facing through His mercy and grace, because there really is no limitation or failure that is too big for Jesus to overcome. And the second is, uh, in my own personal life, one of the downsides of being a preacher is you get to do a lot of self-reflection, and that's uncomfortable. Um, one of the things is I, I had to ask myself, what are the limitations in my own life that I've been letting run a little lampant, lampant, rampant, rampant, um, uh, the last little while, you know, and I have excuses. We all have excuses, you know, you know, there's a pandemic and I've got a toddler and there's just that, and you know, but um, I was thinking one of the limitations that, that I have is I don't see enough of you enough. I don't, I'm not building enough relationships with enough of you enough. 
There's a better way of phrasing that. But um, we have the technology. We can, you know, we can rebuild him, the man. Um, the, I would be interested in hosting a small group over Zoom one night a week. If you are interested in joining a small group of people interested in building faith, community, mission with God, I would be interested in doing that with you. And it seems like, as the news tells us anything, it seems like things are not going down, they're getting worse. <laughs> we may be in this situation for a bit longer than we'd like to be. And maybe three months ago, I thought, well, this is temporary. We'll get back to doing what we were going to do beforehand. But that's limitation thinking. Let's move forward for where we are now. Uh, if you're interested in something like that, the goals would be threefold. Uh, would be um, listening and trying to discern the will of God, uh, growing together in faith and relationship, and going on mission with God, which, spoiler alert, they're actually one goal, it's all the same thing, but um, uh, then talk to me because I'd love to grow with you even in this difficult time and maybe we can face some of the limitations that we have together in a constructive, positive way and move forward. So those are my two applications. Um, I hope they're useful to you this morning. Uh, and um, that's great. Thank you. I chose that song because it relates to one of the best stories in the Bible about faith and about your limitations, uh, specifically water and walking on it. We know that Peter, um, he set his eyes on Jesus, and as long as he set his eyes on Jesus, he stayed on the water. And when he took his eyes away from Jesus, he fell. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a um, twist and turn here. I'm gonna ask everybody to pick a number between one and three and keep it in your mind. Does everybody have their numbers? Okay. Okay, so the people that chose number one, hold up your hand. So we've got one over there, perfect. You are the manager of my workplace. You have just been told that one of your staff has contracted COVID. So your job is going to be to call all the parents, to call all the staff, to contact public health, and to hold calls with the newspapers. So you've got a tough job. Who picked number two? Okay, we got a lot of number twos. You're frontline workers, but you have not been in contact with the person. So, Go get your PPE on, which means your gown, your gloves, your surgical mask, and your shield. And you're just gonna go back to work and try to pretend that nothing happened. But you get to go home and you get to go to the grocery store and you get to go, um, you know, basically go get your gas, do your things, because you haven't had firsthand contact. So you guys have got it pretty good. Who chose number three? Okay, guess what? You're in my group because you've come in contact with someone who had COVID. So almost a month ago now, maybe about three weeks ago, I went to work. Unbeknownst to me, I wore my mask. During a shift change, I stood a few feet away from a person, con, you know, talked about what had happened during the day. Didn't think anything of it. And a week later, I got a call down to the office. Um, so you're gonna need to put your, your PPE on. You've been in contact with someone who has COVID. The blood ran from my face. My first thoughts were, I didn't think this was gonna happen. I thought about my mom, I thought about my daughter, and I thought about my church family. And I responded, I'm high risk. And my manager looked me back in my face and said, I know. And I don't think I heard anything else after that moment. 
You know when you watch those TV programs and you see a person kind of fade out from the conversation and their hearing kind of goes fuzzy? That was me. So I took a deep breath and I looked at my manager and my shift supervisor and I said, okay, I can do this. I can do this. A lot of the songs today talked about doing hard things. Standing up, being faithful, walking through your Christian life. We do have limitations. Last night was the first night in a month that I fell asleep before 11 o'clock and didn't wake up every hour. So today I'm not as sleep deprived as I have been the last three weeks. I had limitations. I couldn't come to church for the last two weeks. I couldn't come set up for church in the last two weeks. That really, really bothered me. I can do hard things. Teachers talk about that phrase for their kids all the time. You can do hard things. It's that, that process of motivating a person. It's pretty much 70% of the conversation I have with one of my clients. You've got this. You can do this. I know this is hard but you can do this. Philippians 4, 13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. What this experience has taught me over the last month is I had to put faith in my program manager that they were gonna do the right thing for me. I had to put faith in Jesus and in God and the Holy Spirit that I could get through this. I had to put faith that if I contracted COVID, I knew where I was going to go. That might seem like a big leap because obviously I look pretty healthy and pretty good, but I made a prediction way back in April that within a year, everybody would know at least one person who had been affected by COVID. I now know six people who have had family members die. I know five people who have had COVID. That is a hard thing. But the reason why I'm up here right now during this service is because Jesus did a hard thing. Jesus sat in the garden and he said, Lord, I don't know that I could do this. Father, I don't think I can do this. And you know what? God said, you can do hard things. So he did a hard thing for us so that we could have eternal life. So that if we get sick and we die, we know where we're going. So I say to you today, you can do hard things. COVID is hard. Dying is hard, but you can do hard things. Let's pray. Dear Father, dear Lord, Holy Spirit, thank you for getting us through the hard times, for helping us to know that you're always beside us, that we have limitations, but your love, your grace, your acceptance of us, it puts the strength back in our lives. Dear Lord, thank you for your sacrifice, for doing that hard thing, for doing the thing that you didn't want to do, that you questioned, that you wondered, why, why me? Why do I have to do this? Thank you. Thank you for taking that step for us, for being the person that's in between us and our eternal life. We ask you, Lord, as we take the communion today, that you would always be a presence in our lives and help us to show to others that they can do hard things, that they can come to Christ, that they can take you as their savior, and that they too can have eternal life. And we say this all in your name, Jesus, amen.
Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Paul, for your message this morning and Kristen for your thoughts. I'd like to just leave you with one thought. To all who are loved by God and called to be saints, may you realize the peace and grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Beansville Church of Christ meets at 4900 John Street, Beansville, Ontario. You can find out more about the congregation and get in touch by visiting beansvillechurchofchrist.ca or our Facebook page.